This show contains movie spoilers and swearing. There escaped prisoners. Everyone. Thieves, bandits, fighters and brawlers. Desperate men. Desperate as you'll ever see. Good. Those are the kind of men I need. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Bite Size Cinema. I'm your host RJ McCready and for this episode I'm going to take you guys back to 1983 to look at the sword and sorcery sci-fi fantasy movie Kroll. So let's play you guys a trailer and I'll see you soon. Beyond our time, beyond our universe, there is a planet besieged by alien invaders where a young king must rescue his love from the clutches of the beast or risk the death of his world. A world called Krull. On his help! We'll fight together. To this world have come the Slayers and their overlord, the Beast. If you consent to be my queen, I will halt the attacks of the Slayers. Their incredible power has taken the planet by force. Their inhuman savagery has got to be stopped. And these are the ones who must stop it. Thieves. Let's just kill them and be done with it. Warriors. Wizards. A changeling. For that rudeness, I think I'll turn you into a goose. A cyclops. That's the second time you've saved my life. A child. A king. I give fire to water. It will not return, except from the hand of the woman I choose as my wife. Unlikely allies. Well, you heard him. We are now an army. Battling an unbeatable enemy. For the life of the Princess Lissa. He's too powerful. And the freedom of the planet Kroll. <laughs> Courage lives in many worlds. But the bravest of all is Kroll. A world light years beyond your imagination. And welcome back everybody. So the synopsis of this film is a prince and a fellowship of companions set out to rescue his bride from a fortress of alien invaders who have arrived on their home planet. It's a two hour runtime as a PG, came out in 1983. It was directed by P.T. Yates. The only other film I've seen him direct is the film Bullet with Steve McQueen, which is a iconic movie. And... Um, it stars Ken Marshall, Lissa Anthony, Freddie Jones, uh, Bernard Breslau, who is basically uh, carry-on royalty. He's the guy who plays the Cyclops in this, so you may or may not know that. Um, you've also got uh, Alan Armstrong, who plays Torquil, who is kind of like the sort of Han Solo type character in this, which I'll get into later on. Um, so it's got a really good cast. It had a massive budget of $47 million back in the day. And um, let's face it, this film came off the um, success of Star Wars. Star Wars came out, it was a massive movie, it's sci-fi, um, which has spawned a massive franchise. And then the studios have thought, obviously people enjoy going to see a sci-fi movie, so let's do one with some sword and sorcery. And... Um, if I'm honest with you, I have not seen a movie like this before, nor have I seen a film like this since. Kroll is kind of unique, where it is a film that um, you could kind of possibly say it's kind of like something like Willow, or, you know, films like uh, Beastmaster. Um, but 
at the same time, it's it, it's kind of like its own film because you've got the sword and sorcery. You've got guys riding around on horses. It's still primitive. You've got the castles. Um, and I suppose, as I mentioned, like the Excalibur story, it's kind of like that meets um, an alien invasion movie, which is the you know general plot of this movie where a prince has to rescue a princess because they've been invaded by alien slayers, which is pretty cool. But the thing with this movie is it, it's not... It is sci-fi, but the sci-fi works really well where the uh, beast that invades the planet Krull with his slayers, they still ride horses and they still have primitive looking weapons because they're kind of like um, spears, but then the spears let out like a electric sort of plasma energy which kind of brings that sci-fi element to it. And then the actual uh, beast fortress that propels itself through space doesn't look to doesn't look like it's come out from Battle Beyond the Stars, shall we say, just for example. It, it, it's basically like a mountain that flies and then lands on the planet. So that is something I like about this film. It, it's really got a really good balance. And then you've kind of got the um, mythology, as I said, like with Excalibur. Uh, you got, you've got this cool weapon in this movie called the Glaive. Um, which is funny, I've seen. I've heard a lot of people mention this when they watch this film because you've got our main hero who meets this old guy who's kind of like the sort of Obi-Wan Kenobi character. It's Freddie Jones, he plays Yoon, the, the old one. And um, I've kind of jumped forward here, but obviously he, our, our hero, Prince Colwyn, was going to get married to, to Lissa. It's going to be like a form formation of um, uh, two cities, I suppose you could say, two opposing kings that had a little bit of beef with each other but because of this marriage it's going to make things all great and with them being married it would make them more powerful and it's like this prophecy to say that once they are married then they will be able to rule the universe and there'll be peace but then obviously that's where the beast comes in to stop this marriage and then captures Lissa. Um, so now you've got our hero who has lost everything, including his father and the city's been fallen. And you get this pretty cool scene where the slayers turn up and, you know, uh, you, you see their weapons, as I said, you know, these spears with these lightning bolts that come out of it. Um, and you just see how badass they are. And then you get a couple of stuff. Is it this... No, I don't think you see, get, see a kill, kill scene of a slayer because once they do get killed, there's like this bug or something that comes out of their head, which is pretty gruesome for a PG, and they kind of make this like a tight noise. Um, but you see that later on. But yeah, going back to the um, glaive, um, you get this cool scene where um, Prince Colwyn climbs a mountain and he puts his hand into some lava and he retrieves this cool looking glaive, which is like a five or six bladed um, throwing star. And you think he's going to use it, but he doesn't. And then all of a sudden, the, you know, Yun goes, oh, don't use it. Only use it when you need to. And you think, okay, so <laughs> we have to wait till later on. Then the other part of this movie which I absolutely love is the fact that you've got our prince who bands up with some bandits and some cutthroats and this is where you get the introduction of Alan Armstrong who plays Torquil who kind of steals the show for me in this movie because he's kind of like the sort of Han Solo type character he's badass um, he's a criminal he's chained up but at the same time he's got He's got good intentions there, you know. There's a good, there's a good man to, to become of him, which you find out later on. And he's got his morals. And there's a cool scene where he comes out and says, "Look, um, I will join you on this quest to go and rescue your princess, but um, I'm going to keep these chains on until we've succeeded, which is pretty cool." And then you, there's a character in this, uh, Todd Carty, who was in um, a film in the uh, film. A TV show in the UK called EastEnders. Uh, you also got Robbie Coltrane, and Liam Neeson is there as well as one of the uh, one of the bandit type characters. Before he had a particular set of skills, because he could have taken this whole job on, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you got the band of uh, cutthroats, 
And then they've now got to try and find the fortress, which keeps on moving all over the place. It only stays in one place per per day, keeps moving around. So they have to go and see the find the seer, um, who's like a, a, a prophet. He, he'll be able to help them out. And then you're introduced to another character who's like... Um, I kind of like the comic relief in this. It's um, Ergo the, the Magnificent. Uh, the actor is David Batley. The only other thing I've seen him in is uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, where he plays a school teacher. Um, yeah, no, it's good. It, it's kind of like the sort of C3PO character, I guess, from, from Star Wars. Um, they meet this here. They have to go to this swamp. Um, and you get this really cool scene now where our heroes are walking through this swamp. And this is easy, my f- the favourite part of, my mo- of the movie for me here. I love it. Walking through the swamp, you've got that James Horner soundtrack here, which I forgot to mention. The James Horner soundtrack in this movie is awesome. And I listen to, I listen to it all the time. Um, it, it, it's incredible. Talk about a, a soundtrack that really pumps the movie along. It's, it's very powerful. And this is one of my favourite scores for it now, the, the, the battle scene in the swamp. Um, they're walking along, the Slayers come out from the swamp. Uh, you hear the, the, the Slayers blasters and our heroes um, fight them with their swords. And this is where you kind of like get a little bit of Bond in between Prince Colwyn and Torquil now because he's basically, you know, it's almost like he's kind of enjoying himself now because he's having a punch up and um, he's helping out Colwyn in their, yeah, like I say, they're starting to bond almost like brothers in a way. Um, they lose a couple of their guys here um, and then you get this uh, terrifying scene now. For, you know, they really are pushing that PG for this movie where the seer. Um, gets taken over by some sort of shapeshifter, um, which is terrifying actually <laughs> for this this movie. Um, but at the same time, I think it's good. I think it's good that you kind of get that little bit of tension. Um, so after this battle, um, you get a couple of guys that sink into the swamp as well. So you get some um, uh, some drama sequences here. And then the seer, who has been taken over by this shapeshifter, he tries to kill Prince Colwyn, and then um, I think it's the Cyclops that intervenes, um, who chucks his like, trident through him, and then you get this scene now where uh, the seer's head just blows up, and uh, he just sort of vanishes into the swamp. So yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool scene. And um, that's the other thing with this movie, it does move at a pace which moves us on to the next part of the quest where um, Freddie Jones's character only has his, uh, he, he has no other choice but to go and see the widow of the web which is a woman that he has some history with he goes into this cave you get this pretty cool stop motion um, an- animated uh, type spider um, he basically makes a deal with the widow um, for some information of where the fortress is um, He's basically got um, enough time to try and get out from the the cave. He's basically got like a bag of sand or something like that f- to exchange this information for his soul or something. Um, so you get a scene here where he's got, got the information. He goes out from the cave. He's being chased by the st- spider. Um, and then before he dies, he... He tells Prince Colwyn where the uh, fortress is going to be, and it's going to be in the like sand dunes or something like that, which is about two or three thousand miles away from where they are, um, or two thousand leagues, is what they say in this movie. And the only way they're going to be able to do that is with some badass fire mares, which are horses which fly through the sky with uh, flames coming from their hoofs. Um, so th- yeah, this is another favourite part of my s- of of this movie for me. Um, next to the swamp scene, they manage to um, pursue these uh, fire mares, jump on, and off they go because the fire mares can uh, gallop a a, a, f- a thousand leagues an hour or something like that. They're pretty quick. Um, and like I say, you get this cool scene now where they're flying through the sky. You've got the James Horner soundtrack. Uh, which is the same music from the title music. 
Um, and they arrive at the fortress where they make some heavy resistance from the slayers. Uh, some of the main characters get killed here. Robbie Coltrane gets killed, unfortunately. Uh, he comes out with, you know, a nice quote now where he says, you know, it, it, it was worth it, you know, trying to trying to help you out. So, um, you know, he feels like he's, he's, he's done something good in his life, obviously from his past or whatever. Um, but then... As, as it goes along, as they get into the fortress, uh, Liam Neeson gets killed, and you're beginning to think, oh, any of these characters are going, going to survive. And they generally feel quite sad when these guys die, because you kind of invested your time with these characters, and you like them, and you like the fact that their their story's progressing, and they're changing, and they're trying to do the right thing. Um and then Torquil, as it goes along, he's just becoming more and more badass, you know, he's, he's got his axe... Um, he's taken out the slayers, you know, he's, he's, he's almost like the guy that's going to single-handedly rescue the princess and sort of uh, t- take the princess for himself, you know, but <laughs> he doesn't. Um, and now you kind of get the um, finale scene where Colwyn gets to use the glaive, finally. Um, and it's pretty cool where he throws it from his hand and it's... Like a like I say, it's like a throwing star that goes into the beast, but it doesn't really do anything. It it it, it slashes the beast in the stomach, I think. But it's actually the thing that actually stops the beast is the um, amalgamation of the prince and the the princess, like this marriage that was supposed to happen in the beginning, because when they when they unite, they become powerful and then all of a sudden you've got this like flamethrower coming out of their hands which ultimately destroys the beast and he blows up and the you get this scene now, I think that I've seen this before in other movies where the actual place is starting to crumble down it's very much like uh, the end of uh, Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger where they're taking out the saber-toothed tiger and stuff starts to crumble down and um, our heroes have to try and get out which they do um, and the remaining um, members of the group who do survive is Torquil, uh, Todd Carty's character, Titch um, Ergo the Magnificent, obviously the Prince and the Princess and um, they manage to run away from the fortress, it blows up and you get this scene now where they're walking off into a lovely field and this is where Prince Colwyn comes out and says to uh, Torquil, he says, look, you can have these keys. And then Torquil comes out and goes, only the Lord Marshal has the keys. And he goes, yeah, that's right. And he just laughs, uh, which is pretty cool. And now you get like a narration from Freddie Jones where he sort of basically says, you know, the, you know, where they get married and, you know, they rule the galaxy and uh, live happily ever after. So, it, you know, it's, as I said, uh, yeah, it's a good film. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a movie I keep going back to. Um, it's unique, I think. Uh, there's there's other films like it. I, I kind of put it into the same category as um, uh, films like uh, Never Ending Story, Battle Beyond the Stars, um, and Willow. Uh, they they all sort of go into the same type of leap. As I said at the beginning of the show, I, I, I still think that Kroll is is unique to its own, and um, we we may see some um, another movie like this. Could could you remake Kroll? I'm not sure. Um, possibly, um, but again, I think the original is so good. And one of the highlights for me is. Um, the soundtrack from from James Horn. I think the, the, the soundtrack to this this film is just incredible. Um, I can easily listen to that on with with some headphones whilst I'm either commuting to work. And uh, <laughs> cheesy as it is, you feel like you're just going to go and rescue a princess with a band of cutthroats every time I listen to that. So, uh, um, so there you go, guys. That is my. Um, bite-sized review of Kroll. I knew I was going to get around to doing this film at some point because um, I'm up to about 120 odd episodes and I still haven't reviewed it yet. Um, so here it is. There you go. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the episode, everybody. Um, 
I will be back soon. Uh, I've kind of, I'm kind of just making it up as I go along this month for for episodes. I do have um, the crow in the works with Come Through Dave. We just had to uh, postpone that just down to trying to um, get a date together. Um, and I've also spoken to Mr. Court Sarps from Cinema Sarps. Hello, Court. I know you listen to the show. Uh, at some point we're going to try and do the movie Clue t- together so we're going to need to get that sorted out and I've also spoken to uh, Darren Wilson from the Psychosomatic podcast where we're going to try and do uh, the class of 1999 so there's a few things that I need to organise, I will do um, I do get this stuff done eventually I've just dropped a um, a interview with Alan A. A. Pone, so go and check that out. That was a great interview, the uh, makeup artist from, from Hollywood. Um, and as, as I've said before, I've got um, an interview with CJ Graham at the end of uh, this month, which is Jason Voorhees from uh, Friday the 13th Part 6. So there's, there's stuff kicking about. Um, and I'll, I'll let you into a secret. This I wasn't going to do Crow, um, but... I woke up this morning and had a little bit of time on my hands and I thought, let's talk about Kroll. I've seen the film so many times, so I just thought I'd fire up the mic and I will talk. So this is kind of me just making hours ago along this morning. So uh, there you go. Um, the other thing to mention is my other show, The Mystery Vault Podcast. Latest episode was um, Sleepy Hollow. Um, I am doing a episode as a listener request from my friend and listener Darren Randall who said about a ancient computer I can't remember the name of it now as a name but I'm just doing some research for that so that will be dropping soon as well so look out for that as a next episode so uh, that is it people um, like I say hope you enjoy the show just do a little bit of admin now I am a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network, so please go and check out all the other shows on there. Um, you can find the Bite Size Cinema on iTunes, uh, Spotify, YouTube, several other players. If you put in Bite Size Cinema Podcast into Google, it'll take you to a listening platform. And the place where I'm most active, the place where you can contact me is on Facebook. So if there's any films that you want me to review, let me know. Post them on there. Um, And that's about it, guys. So keep it bite-sized, keep it safe, and I'll see you soon. enjoyed this show then make sure you check out the other great shows on the legion podcast network like cinema psyops cinema beef devour the podcast duncan and Bo come correct exploding heads horror movie podcast friday the 13th get slayed the hell Ming power hour hello this is the doom show hero hero go show kill the cast underwater kaiju from outer space jerry hates action legion after dark metal health obsessive cinema discourse Pick Six Movies, the podcast by The Cemetery, the podcast on Haunted Hill, the Psycho-Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shadecast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Witch vs. The Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.